Today, here in the presence of the Lord, is the most important thing that's happening in Australia. Have you ever thought of that? Coming into God's presence, humbling ourselves before him, seeking his will and word. I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And sometimes I drive past the cricket ground or the footy ground on a Saturday and I see thousands of cars and I think, they're worshipping. Well, in a sense. Oh, that they would know the Lord. Praise and glory. You know, when our children grow up, and we have children today and they were wonderful during children's church, we teach them boundaries. We teach them that the stove is too hot. Don't touch the stove. And we create rules. Even when we're crossing a busy road, look to the left, look to the right. And we want our children to understand that parents give our children rules. Now, there's children's activity happening. So if children want to hop out with Sister Rebecca, there's lots of activities happening there. And so um, I'm talking about children at the moment learning um, boundaries, you know, laws, you know. Um, there are perilous consequences for running across the road without looking to the left and right. You know, sometimes even adults fall prey to it. You see a beautiful stretch of road and you think, how could two vehicles do a head-on collision there? It was just perfectly engineered, no trees or low visibility, but was it speed or alcohol, drugs or mobile phone? Who knows? But somebody broke a law. You know, the laws in Australia uh, around suburban streets, 50 kilometres an hour. I think outside of schools is 40 kilometres an hour. The maximum speed limit on the freeway is 110 kilometres an hour and you have other speed limits in between. And they're designed to, to teach us what the consequences are of breaking the law, the law of the land. There are consequences. It's either if I speed, it's either a ticket from the police, or worst case scenario, irreparable damage in somebody's life and property. So there is, is a, there are laws, and the idea is, is we must be obedient to those laws as a good citizen of this country. Now, we are citizens of the kingdom of God and we understand that God speaks to us about his great moral law that speaks to us. And I'm, I'm going to talk not only about obedience, I'm going to talk about willing obedience. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. If Rebecca asks me to do something, let me not do it grudgingly. Let me do it with all my heart. You know, she's my wife and vice versa. And, you know... And, you know, for, for adults, there's always the temptation, even in our spiritual lives, to take shortcuts, to try to work things out on our own. And yet, the word obedience within Christian circles tends to get diminished in the broader Christian landscape because, because we don't hear a lot about obedience, mainly because the negative bias that you are trying by obeying to earn your salvation by works. Or, I don't like obedience because I think of doggy obedience training school, where we take a dog and make it obedient, and I don't want that kind of man, I'm a free person. Or, we think about a horse. A horse, a wild stallion, is broken into obedience, so he knows how to walk and prance and follow his master's orders. And so we shy away from the idea of obedience, we talk more in the greater Christian circles about faith and grace and mercy, maybe also justice. And, um, and I want to talk a little bit about this element of what our response is to Jesus. He came and gave his life for us. What is our response? And I hope today we find today's message encouraging and empowering. Um, John was one of the closest disciples to Jesus and he tells us, and I've got the scriptures on the screen, everyone who makes a practice of sinning. Now, what's sinning? Paul says in, I think, Romans, or one of his epistles, I would have not known what sin is, except the law says, thou shalt not covet. That's one of the Ten Commandments. And you know, out of all the Ten Commandments, especially the six, the last commandment has to do with what's happening in your mind. Because before you steal, you covet. Before you commit adultery, you covet. So, very powerful. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Um, wow, John lays it out very clearly. Jesus talks about people who love him and proclaim his name, 
but Jesus excludes them from eternity because they do great miracles. They love the Lord. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, so they recognise the lordship of Jesus, they call him Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So we have a response to do the will of their Father. And what is his will? Well, we'll explore that as we go. On that day, there's a great day of judgment coming, a great day when every person who's ever lived will stand before God, either in the righteousness of Christ or condemned by their own words and actions. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? So obviously they, they prophesied, thus says the Lord, in Jesus' name, and cast out demons in your name. So people who had extraordinary burdens in their lives in the spiritual world of darkness had it broken in the name of Jesus? Wow. And do mighty works in your name. So you would think those Christians were really on the right side of history. But then Jesus says in verse 23, Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What is Jesus saying there? Because those people really believed they were on the right side of history. <coughs> you know, Jesus speaking of the future in Matthew 24, when the disciples said, when is the end time and the, and the things that are going to happen? So Jesus talks about the fall of Jerusalem. Then he talks about, like Luke 21, the things that are going to happen prior to his return. And because in verse 12, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. How many times have I heard the law has been nailed to the cross? The Ten Commandments have been nailed to the cross. We're not under law, but we're under grace. Now, we've got to be very careful what we say here to make sure that we're staying so we don't live in an age of lawlessness. Thinking that we are Christians, thinking we love the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, in word, but not in deed. And um, I see that in the broader body of Christ, and it's a challenge. Um, by definition, sin is the breaking of God's law. As Paul said, I would have known what sin was except by the law, you shall not covet. 1 John 3, 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practice lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. We covered that a moment ago. In the King James Version, it says sin is the transgression of the law. So the law is very interesting. What are you talking about the law? God has certain commandments. You know, the Ten Commandments were given to ancient Israel under the terms of the Old Covenant. They occupied, under the mercy seat, in the Ark of the Covenant, the tablets of stone with the Ten Words of the Ten Commandments. All the other laws and statutes and judgments of God were outside of that. But the Ten Commandments occupy a very special place. But then there are Christians who shy away from teaching their children about the Ten Commandments because they don't want to give their children the subtle path to legalism, that you are trying to earn your salvation through meritorious works. I've never committed adultery, I've never murdered, I've never lied, I've, etc., etc. Um, let's go back to Jesus' teachings, because Jesus talks a lot about the commandments and he talks a lot about the law. And in John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay, wow. Jesus has something to say. What, what are his commandments and why is it very important for Jesus? And we'll see that love and the word of God in his commandments go together. In fact, somebody asked Jesus, what's the greatest law? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. Do you know that's the Ten Commandments in summary? The love of God and the love of fellow man. And um, his teaching is replicated through the rest of the scripture in the Old Testament and the New Testament and clearly perpetuated under the terms of the New Covenant. And I want to explore the topic of obedience a willing obedience under the terms of the New Covenant. Um, and I want to start out with the greatest act of obedience in Scripture. The greatest act. We've talked about the birth of Jesus, now we're going to talk about his death. Jesus' obedience to his Father's will is exempt, is explained in the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes that night into that garden near the Mount of Olives and he prays. And he says, Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Now, if you read the prophecies, Jesus, who came from the Father and pre-existed as the Word of God together with the Father, born of the Virgin Mary as the Son of God and the Son of Man, was privy to every piece of detail of how he would suffer. Scoffing, beating, 
scourge, his face marred beyond recognition, nails in his hands, spear in his side, blood and water pouring out, and three days and three nights later, resurrected again. He was privy to that. None of us are privy to how we're going to die. Cancer, car accident, natural death, whatever it is. Jesus came for this particular purpose, but he prayed. And when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, like great drops of blood falling from his forehead, says Luke, in Luke's testimony, an angel came to minister to him. The intensity of being the son of man, of facing a brutal Roman torture, crucified alive for six hours. I had a little prickle in my finger. You can still see the little gap there. Oh, the little prickle was, I picked and poked and Rebecca picked and poked and got the little prickle out until it was off my conscience. Jesus had nails in his hands and feet. And the suffering and the pain and the anguish. And what's more, he did it willingly to this Father's will. It was the only way that you and I could be redeemed. That's the centre of the Gospel message. It's very powerful. And when John the Baptist, who was born six months before Jesus, was 30, he proclaims Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Everybody knew the sacrificial lamb was a male lamb, a year old without blemish. It's very symbolic. Shed blood and sacrificed. And he laid down his life so you and I could have life. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. You are cleansed. You are transformed by Jesus' shed blood. And Jesus' act of obedience was something that no one can, nor are we required to replicate. But we are to follow Jesus and love him. And, and the, you know, what's a question is that I wrestle with. Is my life a willing sacrifice for his glory because of what Jesus did on our behalf? Let's go to the Garden of Gethsemane, but we'll read it from the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 7. In the days of his flesh... Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. When a 33-year-old man, 33-and-a-half-year-old man, cries out to God in sweat and tears, to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. So God the Father heard Jesus' prayer, and God the Father could have prevented him or saved him. If it is your will, you've got to spare me this. Although he was a son, in verse 8, he learned obedience. Obedience, there's that word, through what he suffered. I want you to think about that this week and wrestle what it is to go through difficult things, face the giants in your life and learn what obedience is to the Father's will. And being made perfect, he became a source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This idea of obedience manifest in Christ's sacrifice, how Jesus understood what a, the pain of obedience is and that we are called to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. All in the book of Hebrews chapter 5. Wow. What did Jesus say in John 15? Emma read it this morning. Greater love is no one than this. Then someone lay down his life for his friends. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Wow. So there's a connection between sacrifice and love and obedience. I love this scripture in Hebrews 12. We go back to Hebrews again in 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, he did something that no one could do on behalf of you and me, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Why did he endure the cross, despising the shame? And he's seated at the right hand of God because there was a purpose. He was going to, through that act of obedience and sacrifice, bring many sons to glory. Everyone who's sitting here today, all of those listening through live stream, all faithful people across this nation and beyond. Wow. What did Jesus say? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus kept his Father's commandment, was obedient to it. And the Father and Jesus are one. And you and I are called into covenant relationship to be one with Jesus. And there is a responsibility. Responsibility. Let's go to John chapter 15. I know we heard it earlier today. If you love me, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Wow. So there's a responsibility to a relationship. You know that in marriage. There's stewardship and responsibility. You will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Brothers and sisters, Jesus kept his Father's will and commandment at a level 
that transcends our capacity at any level. Verse 11, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. It's good news, brothers and sisters. What Jesus did is not morbid forever. It's great joy. For the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. That's why Jesus is preeminent. And that's why Apostle Paul says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, there's a, a strong call for us to respond to the saving grace of God. Grace is expensive in Jesus' blood. And this call to obedience leads us to a... a you know, he's saying, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender. What does authentic surrender look like? It's followed by a deep and enduring faith. You know, it's easy to say, I believe, a cerebral assent rather than deep conviction. Not just a one-time confession, but always living, I in you, Lord Jesus, you in me. And what happens? James says, your faith is a starting point, but I'll show you my faith by my works. I have fruit for it. Things that I've gone through, I've struggled with. I've obeyed your law, your commandments. This reminds me, if I go back thousands of years, more than maybe 15, 16 1,900 years before Jesus, I think. We go to Abraham. Abraham was known as a friend of God. He's become to know the father of the faithful. There's some things we can take out of Abraham's life. Now, Abraham was old. Sarah had long died. He'd married Keturah. There were sons born to him and other sons. But Abraham, the scripture says, and I think it's Genesis 26, gave all his wealth to Isaac. There was Ishmael, and there's a whole lot of other sons born to Keturah. He gave all his wealth to Isaac. And the Lord appears to Isaac and tells him of the promises that the Lord made to Abraham to be perpetuated in Isaac. And in Genesis 26, the reason for the blessings coming to to Isaac was, verse 5, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. And you sort of think, well, what commandments? What laws? What judgments? What statutes? We only learn about that from Mount Sinai when the law was given from Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments and throughout the Hebrews they had lots of, I think, 613 laws. Um, We think of that. But Abraham, now you can say, oh, well, Moses just wrote that because Moses was a lawgiver and so he attributes these things to Abraham. But this is God's words to Abraham, that you to, to Isaac, attributing that he kept God's laws, his commandments and statutes and judgments. You know, we can actually realise from that singular statement in Genesis 26, long before the Sinaitic Covenant, that people knew and and understood and lived by the word of God long before the first covenant was ratified, um, the the old covenant was ratified in Mount Sinai. You know, and this is where, as Christians, we need to read the whole word, every word that comes from the mouth of God. I think it's in Matthew 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And unfortunately, you know, there's been a risk factor. When the Gideons, they do a wonderful job, but they give a Bible that has the Psalms and Proverbs and the New Testament. And many people have that Bible, and you can go to a motel still, across the Nullarbor, as I did a couple of years ago, and open the drawer, and there's a Gideon Bible there. The only challenge is, the story of Abraham is not in there. So people who read the Bible miss out on that particular statement and many others, etc. And so we end up holding what I would call a licentious grace in the place of not total obedience and surrender. What I mean by licentious grace is there is a theology, it's very dangerous, that the more we sin, the more God applies grace to us. And that makes God more righteous. So whether we sin or we don't sin, God is gracious. He applies that grace to us. And it can lead us into what I call licentious grace, that the idea of repent and believe repentance is minimised. Part of Jesus' message was repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And obedience is fundamental to the nature of law. 
you drive home today at 120, 130 kilometres an hour, you'll either get picked by the police because it's breaking the law or the catastrophic will happen. So brothers and sisters, law is indisputable even in the Gentile world. And I found this very interesting in Romans chapter 2. Paul talks about Gentiles who don't have the gospel still understand by conscience the need for law, good civil behaviour. I find that in Romans chapter 2. Let's begin in verse 12. For all have sinned without, who, all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Verse 13. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So obviously those religious people who said, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons and prophesy in the name, were hearers of the law, and they were convicted by the hearing, but then they're doing in obedience, but doers of the law. For when the Gentiles, who do not have the law, they've just grown up in their own godless pagan societies, by nature do what the law requires. They know it's wrong to murder or to take somebody else's wife. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show, in verse 15, that the work of the law is written in their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. Brothers and sisters, we are created in God's image and likeness. There is a divine imprint, if only we'll let the Lord. You know, obedience was... Let me take a, a caveat and a, down a different direction here. Remember in the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. What did God require? Obedience, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A choice. Now, we know the devil came in, deceived Eve, but Adam intentionally took and they disobeyed. And when they disobeyed, they faced the consequences. It's interesting that obedience was put, we are free moral agents. But why did God make the choice and tell him, you know, don't touch that. For the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of evil, you will die. And the devil comes along with another narrative. And Eve says, it looks good. Let me try some. Here, Adam, try some. So there was an obedience test right in the Garden of Eden. Let's continue. While their conscience also bears witness, their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. This is what some, a lot of scientists and philosophers wrestle with. What is human conscience and the predication to good or evil? It's not a question we could answer in an analytic laboratory. It's a spiritual question. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the call to obedience has never been diminished either from the Garden of Eden or, as Jesus says, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one of the dot of the law to become void. Which commandment? Now today, we celebrate on the Saturday Sabbath. There's a lot of people who would say, oh, well, Sunday's more inclined for that. Well, we know that today is the only day in Scripture sanctified for rest and for holiness, for worship and fellowship. And, and we are Christ-centred, spirit-led, Bible-based, Sabbath-celebrating. Now, we don't earn our righteousness by keeping Sabbath, but by keeping Sabbath is our response to Christ's sacrifice, to be completely... Surrendered. I surrender all, all to Jesus. I surrender. What does it look like? It's a life of faith. You know, Abraham had a heart to obey God. We see that Abraham tithed. He gave a tenth of all his spoils to Melchizedek, king of Salem, who turned out to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you go back further down the genealogy, all the way to Christ, halfway there, you'll find King David. David had a heart for the Lord, just like just like Abraham did. Let's have a look at Psalms. In Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Didn't we sing a song earlier, Lord, open the eyes of my heart? I want to see you in your glory. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous together. Read Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon, um, Proverbs, sorry, where the wise man says, My son, 
Listen to my commandment. Obey my voice. Don't go after the loose woman. Because the fleeting pleasures of a sin will be just that. It will be bitterness to you afterwards. For the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb, using agricultural terms of gold. If I came in with a kilo of gold, everybody said, can I feel the weight of it? You know, like it's got value. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, in keeping them varies great reward. And if we jump to the end of the scriptures, Jesus says, behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone what he has done. There's a doing. There's a response. You know, in the book of Revelation, there's a definition of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. There's another test one there, those who keep the commandments of God and their testimony of Jesus. And so you and I, just like Jesus surrendered to his Father, we surrender to Jesus Christ completely. And we are part of the body of Christ and we have an important job to do. We are, in one sense, Gideon's army, small but mighty, I know that we are saved by grace through faith and our lives are complete surrender, total obedience and ongoing transformation. Jesus obeyed his heavenly Father, brothers and sisters, in that our, that forever, for all of history, will forever be honoured. Jesus is preeminent, says Apostle Paul. And brothers and sisters, we are called to total surrender. You know, you see snippets of it in the New Testament. Peter is given a vision a great vision sheet with all kinds of unclean animals. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And his first response is, but I've never eaten anything unclean. So people can take that scripture and say, well, therefore we can eat all things because God said you can eat anything. Snails and, 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 and shellfish and, and pork sandwiches. But Peter, you read the scripture, walks away from the vision wondering what it meant. Now, how could Peter say, I've never eaten anything unclean? because he never saw Jesus eating a ham sandwich or a shellfish hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> he was a sinless sacrifice. So you see little things that, you know, as Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And we see that in Peter's statement there. Peter had been with Jesus, and now Peter, was a, by the Spirit, was abiding in Jesus. And he was strong for what he knew what was right. Brothers and sisters, I want to conclude in Luke chapter 17, verse 10 that reminds us to never do the bare minimum. You love God and I love God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength. We surrender all. In a parable that Jesus told along those lines, he says, you also, in Luke chapter 7, 17 verse 10, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants, we've only done what was our duty. When the Lord gave in his parable talents to certain people, he wanted them to increase. And the person who didn't increase was condemned. And brothers and sisters, may the law of God lead us to Christ, who set the highest example of obedience to the will of the Father. What it means is total surrender, willing obedience, and complete transformation that leads to ultimate glory. Man shall not live by bread alone, said Jesus. It is written, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And today on the screen and on our Bibles in our laps and in our hearts, the Word of God is more strongly imprinted. We live in dangerous and pernicious times. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And the only way that we can be the light of the world is standing on the rock of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.